Thank you for joining our broadcast today at City Life Church. We would love to hear how God is using this ministry to change your life. So please take a moment to send us your story at info at citylifechurch.cc. And if God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, we want to encourage you to partner with us financially to help us to bring God's word to other people. You can go to our website at citylifechurch.cc to find the giving options that work best for you. We've got an encouraging word for you, and we pray that you lean in and engage as we head into the auditorium for today's message. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much, Pastor Tony and and Casey. I'll tell you what, you all are spoiled. I just don't know if you know how spoiled you are. Because there's only one place that worship is better than it is at City Life, and that's in heaven. Pastor Casey, you and your team, you do such an amazing job leading us in worship. Your spirit, your grace, your elegance, your everything you lead with. I thank you, and I honor you for that. As Pastor Tony said, one of my closest friends in all the, in all the world, but I will tell you, if you see him in a cage match, just come help him out, because he won't make it out without you. <laughs> well, let me just say something to, to you, City Life. I want to I honor you for the gift you are to the kingdom of God. Sometimes I, I think that we're so deep in the forest that we can't see the trees that are around us. But you as a church are a bright, bright light in the kingdom. Hundreds of churches look to you to try to figure out how to reach their city and how to do church in a way that represents God with class and with excellence and that's attractive to a world that doesn't know him. And I honor you for the way you serve. I honor you for the way you give, for the way you sacrifice. I honor you today and I thank you for what you do. The kingdom of God is better because of you. And I just want to say thank you. I don't get an opportunity at the Rise Conference to say things like that to you, but I want to, I want to take a minute and say that to you today. Your, your staff, Mike, Justin, so many of your staff that I've been friends with for a long time, they're world-class leaders. They're not hirelings. They are leaders. These people, this staff serves you really, really well. And I thank you for the way that you honor them. God's blessing you because you know what honor looks like. God can get on board with something like that. Amen? So thank you for what you, for what you do. Well, I am really excited about being here today. The only thing that would have make it, made it better if, if my wife would have been able to be with me today, but she has things going on back home that she was unable to get away from. But I'm really, really excited to be able to, to be with you today and just talk for, for a few minutes. And um, I, I look around the, the, the room, I thought about this little girl who... Um, she was get, helping her mom get ready for some friends to come over for dinner. And her mom said, honey, she was only four years old. Her, 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 her mom said, honey, would you like to pray for dinner tonight? And she said, well, mommy, I don't know what to say. And, and the mom said, well, sweetheart, just, just say what you always hear mom say. So it came time for dinner and the guests sat down around the table. And the mom said, honey, would you, would you, would you like to pray? And she said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, go ahead and pray. And the little girl said, Lord Jesus... Why did I invite all these people here today? (laughs) So I say that to say if um, you brought a friend with you today and I showed up rather than Pastor Tony, I promise you it gets better than this. So just bring them back. Just keep on on coming. Here's what I want to do. Today I want to talk to you for a few minutes about something that this church does so well. But I I don't want to speak today as an evangelist or a guest. I'm a pastor. So I want to talk to you as a pastor today. I want to teach you today. Is that okay? I'm going to talk to you about worship. I'm going to to talk to you specifically about this idea that it's more than fanfare. The greatest definition that I think I've ever heard of worship is is a preacher one time. I don't even remember, remember who it was, but he said, worship is just love expressed. Worship is an expression of your love, my love toward toward God. Uh, another way that we, we think about worship so often is worship that we, is something that we give to God. But today I want you to understand that when we get worship right, when we give this thing to God, there's some amazing benefits that we get in return. And the ones I want you to see today are insight, understanding, clarity about your future, about your purpose, about your destiny. Because the Bible said God didn't just create you, but he knew you. And when he knew you, then he formed you. 
He didn't form you and then hope to get to know you. Which means God had a plan for you before he ever made you. And if you want to figure out that plan that he had for you before he made you, you have to learn to hear his voice. And I want to talk to you for a minute today about how worship sets you up to hear the voice of God. I'm going to use one passage of scripture and I want to bounce very slowly through that one passage out of Exodus chapter 13, beginning in verse 2. But I, I want to talk about I want to talk about pseudo-worship today. I mean, you're right here in Champa Bay. How about it? Come on. How many cities get to experience a, a, a World Series championship, a football championship, a, every, and you get WrestleMania too. But in a city like this, there's also a lot of what I'll call today pseudo-worship. If you look up the word pseudo in, in the dictionary, it'll say something like... Uh, uh, false or deceptive or, or, or even a, a sham. But what I want you to see today before we go into God's word is that all over, all over the, the, the country on Sundays, specifically right here down the road at Raymond James Stadium, there's this amazing worship that goes on on Sundays. Tens of thousands of people gather up in this stadium and they just worship all eyes on the field with one goal in mind. How will our team perform today? But here's what's amazing about this worship service. They don't just gather in that church. They're gathering in homes. They're gathering in sports bars, in small groups all over the city to check out that worship service because they want to know what's going to happen that day from goal line to goal line. And you say, well, Scott, how can you call that worship? Well, here's the reason I call that worship. See, the question is not am I or am I not a worshiper? You're a worshiper. Everyone's a worshiper. The question is only what are you worshiping? The reason I call that worship is because what you have is, is thousands of people unapologetically gathered up in a stadium paying homage at a great inconvenience for an extended period of time to that which they hold at high value. One definition of worship is worship, something that's of great worth to you. You need to understand today that worship, when we get it right, plays a key role in our life when it comes to understanding and clarity, when we get it right. And what I want you to hear about worship today is this. Worship is simply your expression, my expression, recognition of God for who he is, for what he's done, and what it is that you're believing God is going to do in your life. Now, verse 2 of Acts chapter, chapter 13 starts like this. While they ministered unto the Lord. While they were ministering unto the Lord. As they were ministering unto the Lord. While they ministered unto the Lord. I know you heard me, but I want to know if you've heard me. As they, they ministered unto the Lord. See, what they're going to discover as they minister unto the Lord is something that they can't do for themselves. They're going to discover something that only God can do for them, watch, as they minister unto the Lord. As, as they minister unto the Lord. Now, this is so important because so often in our culture, we come to church because we want to see what the Lord's going to do for me. We show up to church wondering, how is God going to minister to me today? What is God going to say to me today? While forgetting that worship is not what God does for us, worship is what we do to him. See, we, we forget so often that, that when it comes to worship, when it comes to worship, God is the audience and we are the performers. But we so often show up to church and expect God to perform for us. As they ministered unto the Lord. In your worship, God is always the audience. 
response. And our worship is our ministry. Today, after church, you're going to go to a restaurant. And when you go to the restaurant, you're going to be served by a waiter or a waitress. They are going to minister unto you. They're going to seat you. They're going to place a menu in front of you. They're going to take your request for lunch. They're going to take your request to the kitchen and be certain that it's prepared properly. They're going to bring it back. They're going to place it on the table before you. When you're finished, they're going to clean it up for you. And at the end of that meal, you are going to give them what we call a tip. And the tip that you give them is going to be determined by how well they minister unto you. It's interesting when we think about life in, in this way. Because this in church so often is where the, where the, the, the script has been, has been flipped, I believe. Because we, we so often show up in church expecting the Lord to minister to us before we've ministered to him, before we've given him our praise, we've given him our allegiance, we've given him our commitment, we've given him our perfection. It's like saying, God bless America. When America has said, God, we don't want you at our schools, we don't want you in our government, we don't want you in our workplace, but we want you to bless us. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves, watch, there's, there's, when it comes to fans, it's more than fanfare. There's, there's what I call event fans, and there's what I call serious fans. Now, an event fan, and there, there are event Christians, and there are serious Christians. An event fan is a fan who shows up at the football game on Sunday, but doesn't care about sports on Monday through Saturday, but the next Sunday, they're going to show up for the game again. They're just concerned about, about the event. And in the same way, there are Christians who show up for church on Sunday. They worship. I mean, they put their praise on. But on Monday and Wednesday and Friday, there's no praise in their life. But when they come back the next... Listen, if we only, if we only know God as an event Christian, if we are only a fan based on the events... It means that there's a seven-day gap in our ministry as unto the Lord. We go one day with it, and then we go six days without it until we get it again. Now, Sunday's a big day for food, right? We eat big on Sundays. When you leave this place, you're going to go to a restaurant. You're going to have a big meal. Some of you have something crocking in the crock pot for when you get home, but you're going to eat big on Sunday. Well, how many know the meal that you eat on Sunday is not meant to nourish you all the way through the week until next Sunday? Because I guarantee you, you're going to eat again on Monday. No matter how good you eat on Sunday, you will eat again on Wednesday. But when you come to church and you eat this big meal on Sunday, but then you don't minister unto the Lord all week long, no wonder we wonder why we are malnourished. But I went to church... We consume the big meal on Sunday and we don't worship him. Those next six days. And then we wonder, why can't I feel him? But then there's serious fans. A serious fan is, is a unique breed because there's somebody who knows it is more than about the event. It is bigger than that. Did you know in an average football game, listen, you football fan, did you know in an average football game there is actually only 17 minutes of contact? Now, I know the game lasts for an hour. I know it's for 15-minute quarters, but you're actually going to be there for three hours for 17 minutes of contact. But think about it. the serious fan will leave two hours early. They'll fight traffic, get to their park. Wherever they have to park, they'll walk an ungodly distance to get to the seat that has been assigned to them in that church building. Walk through the heat. They'll walk through the rain. They'll walk through the drunks. They'll walk through the sidewalk preachers to get to that seat that's been. And then whenever they leave, it's going to take them two more hours to get home. And when they get home, the first thing they're going to do is turn on ESPN or NFL Today to review what they had just viewed. And then the serious fan's going to get up on Monday morning and he's going to go to the office. 
And then about lunchtime, he's going to go to the water fountain and he's going to gather up with a small group and they're going to discuss what happened in yesterday's church service. And then when that serious fan gets home, he's going to read the newspaper so he can see the highlights of what he viewed, then reviewed, then had a small group over. And then on Tuesday morning, the serious fan is going to get up and he's going to go online and he's, you know what he's going to do? He, but before the next service even arrives, he's going to be looking at the opponent, his opposition, what he's going to be up against, who's going to be the guest speaker, what's going to happen on, before Sunday even shows up, he's already in preparation for that day. Because he's a serious, serious fan. Now listen, don't ever tell me I can't talk about Jesus. Come on. If we'll, if we'll make the fool over something that wins today and loses tomorrow, is up today and down tomorrow, adds absolutely no value to my today and certainly no value to my eternity, and we can go nuts over that, how many know we ought to be able to lose it over Jesus? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all of, of, all of those things. Listen, Jesus... Jesus, so often we, we, we have um, what, what, what I would just call e event fans. But, but sometimes if we're not careful, watch, we can become fans of the worship, but not really worshipers. And this, this story, this, this little scripture is, is, is about that. While they ministered to the Lord, Response, my response, your response for who he is and everything that he has done. So when you come into a service like this, how many know it's only natural in the presence of God that there be an emotion that's evoked in us? Maybe it's a tear. Maybe it's a lifted hand. Maybe you want to jump. Maybe you want to clap. Maybe you want to sing. Listen to me, men. Listen, guys. Hear me, hear me, hear me. You don't have to worship like a woman to be a worshiper. If it's not in you, if it's not who you are, you don't, have to, you don't have to worship like anybody else. If this isn't your thing and this isn't your thing, maybe hunting's your thing, maybe fishing is your thing, maybe sitting on the back porch overlooking the sunset. When the sun rises, you say, God, thank you for causing the sun to rise. Would you cause the sun to rise in my life today? That worship is every bit as precious to God as the person who sings the loudest and jumps the highest. Because worship is your expression, your response to who God is, what God's done, and what you're believing God to do. So you say, well, I don't really know what God's done. That's okay. You still got a reason to praise him because you're believing him to do something. Uh, now worship is my response, your response to, to who God is. You ever notice nobody, no, uh, Pastor Casey, nobody ever complains about where they have to park down at Raymond James Stadium, how long they have to walk, how long that church service lasts, and they never leave early because they know when they leave something good is going to happen. But some people, when they come to church, not at City Life, but other churches I'm talking about, not, I'm just I'm giving you stuff to talk to your friends about. As they ministered unto the Lord. Do you know why worship is so critical? Critical especially to your destiny, to your future, to your purpose. Worship is, is critical because when you worship, watch this, whether you're worshiping on the back porch of your house or on a boat somewhere, on a golf course or in a deer stand, whether you're worshiping here in this house, worship is, is critical because worship moves you into another realm. Worship is God's plan to move his people into what we call in church the realm of the spirit. Worship is God's way of moving people into a spiritual place so that we can hear from God. As they ministered unto the Lord, as they ministered, as they worshiped, un watch this now, 
because they're getting, what's the context of what God's getting ready to do? It was in the context of their ministry unto the Lord, the Bible says next, the Holy Spirit said. Now watch the context in which the Holy Spirit, anybody want to hear from the Spirit? Come on, anybody want, uh, uh, that was a chance for you to respond. Anybody want to hear from the Holy Spirit? Because you can either do it your way or you can do it his way. And the only way you get to do it his way is to hear from him. Anybody want to hear from the Spirit? As they ministered to the Lord, the Spirit said, as they centered on God, as they praised God, as they were praying, celebrating, as they were making a big deal of God, watch this, the Holy Spirit spoke. Now, let me remind you, the Holy Spirit, you know who the Holy Spirit is, the third person of the Trinity, the the third person in the Godhead. There's the Father, there's the Son, and then there's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's only job is to make the reality of God real to you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit makes God real to you. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it says that the Holy Spirit is for this purpose, to bring life. The life of God to the people of God. It's like this. The Holy Spirit takes a, it, it takes a still picture and he turns it into a motion picture. I'll give it my wife, whenever she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, she was a Catholic girl all of her life, never really heard about salvation, never heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, gets saved, marries me. I'm at a, we're at a, a camp that I did every summer for, um, for teenagers and the last night's always on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, preach the sermon. All these kids come down to receive the baptism. I didn't know, but Elizabeth had come down to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A little Catholic girl says, as she was praying for everything God had for her, to to give her an encounter with the Holy Spirit, she said that God took her to a place that she had never been before, the realm of the Spirit, as she ministered to the Lord. And the Lord, she said, began to show her a black and white film. She said all of the things in her life that she regretted, all of her sins, all of her mistakes, all of her regrets was like the Lord played them in front of her, a motion picture. And then in a moment, it all turned white, and she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was lifting the Spirit of God, the Word of God, off the pages of her life and revealing himself to her. He was turning that still moment into a motion picture show. It became real in her life. As they ministered unto the Lord, it says, the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't just a general speaking. It wasn't just going to all the world. No, it was specific. The Holy Spirit spoke and he said, I know who I want to send. I want to send these two men. I've got Barnabas and I've got Saul. In other words, I know who they are. I know where they are. And I know exactly where I want them to go. You know, the Holy Spirit's job is to make God real to you. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal the purpose and the will and the plan of God to you. But it's as we minister to the Lord that the Holy Spirit, how many know he spoke and he's still speaking? To those who will minister unto the Lord. That's his job. But listen, there's a lot of people, and you know what they're satisfied with? They're satisfied coming to church and let somebody like me yell at them for 30 minutes, the word of God. Did you know that you can know the word of God and the word of God never change you? Did you know that you can be a scholar, you can be a professor, and you can be a preacher? You can know the Word of God, but if you don't know the God of the Word, the Word will never change you. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that lifts the pages of God's Word off of this book and applies them and makes them real to your life. As they... Now listen, in football, let's go back to Raymond James, the, the, the first church of the Buccaneers. Because in football, there's this thing called the rule book. And the league office sets the rules. And they pass the rule book down to every team, every player, and it applies to every game. Now you and I as Christians, we have the rule book. It, it, it sets the standard for the way we live. It sets the standard for the decisions that we make. 
And the rule book never, ever, 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 ever changes. But in the NFL, they also have what's called a playbook. And the playbook is always changing. While the rule book never changes, the playbook is ever changing. It changes according to the teams that they're going to play, to the opponent that they're up against. The playbook doesn't just change from game to game. The playbook changes inside the game. When the original game plan isn't working, there's a guy who sits way up high in the stadium. And he looks down low on the field. And that guy is called the offensive coordinator. And he is watching what's going on on the field. And did you know that he has a microphone and he speaks. And there is a speaker in Tom Brady's helmet. And he speaks to him in his ear. Did you know that? And he's telling him the adjustments to make. This is what the defense is doing now. So this is what you need to do now. The Holy Spirit in your life is the offensive coordinator. Who sits high and he looks low. And he whispers in your heart, you were going to go right, but no, now I want you to go left. You were going to do this, but no, I want you to do that. You normally drive this way to work, but today I want you to drive that way to work because there's an accident that I don't want you to get involved in. He says, you normally go to this restroom at work, but I want you to go to this restroom because there's a conversation down that hallway that I don't want you to be involved in. And the problem is that many, many Christians, we never learn to hear the voice of the Spirit. As they ministered to the Lord, as they worshiped the Lord, the Bible says the Spirit began to speak. Several years ago, my wife and I, we were um, at a friend of our, Benjamin Watson, you may, have, may know him, he played for the Patriots and several other teams. He's a really close friend of ours, and every year we'd go wherever they are, and we'd go to a game, and we'd stay with them. I'll never forget the first year he was with the Patriots. I, um, we were at his house, and um, it was Friday night, and Ben was at practice, and me and Kirsten, his wife, and Elizabeth, my wife, we'd gone out to dinner. We'd come back home. Ben's home. He's at the table um, reading this big book, and I said, man, what in the world is that? He said, that's our playbook. I said, for this week? He said, yeah, for this week. I said, you got to learn all that? He said, yeah, I got to learn all that. And then tomorrow night when y'all drop me off, I'll be tested on that. A playbook that prepared him for the opposition that was getting ready to oppose him. Well, one of the worst things that can happen to a believer is we can know the rule book but not have any clue of the playbook. Because when you know all the rules, but you don't know the plays, the rules will make you legalistic. So how often would you say, I mean, we all may have a different opinion, but How often do you think we need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? It's not a trick question. How often do we need to hear the voice? Help me, somebody. All the time, all day. So if, as they ministered to the Lord, the the Holy Spirit spake, and we need to hear from the Holy Spirit every day, doesn't it just make sense that we need to minister unto the Lord every day? So when you get up in the morning, maybe it, meets, maybe it needs to be more than, more than just, I read my eight verses and now I'm going to pray. But maybe if you want to hear the Spirit today, you need to do more than read the pages on the book. You need to minister unto the one who wrote the book so his Spirit can speak to you the playbook. So my challenge for you today is that you would make it your business to minister unto the Lord every day so that you can hear his plan that day. Do you remember what Jesus said when he taught us how to pray? 
He said, give me this day my daily bread. Why? Because he knew that tomorrow would take care of itself and next week would take care of itself. He didn't need strength today for next month. He needed strength today for today. As you minister unto the Lord, the Bible says that the Spirit spake. Listen, every, every believer, watch, every believer has what we'll call a receiver to pick up the signals from heaven to give us a picture of earth. Every believer has a receiver to give us a picture from heaven of what's happening on, it's called the Holy Spirit. And as they ministered to the Lord, the Spirit spake to them. Listen, when I come in here and I put my worship on, but I go home on Monday, watch, I go home on Monday and I don't worship unto the Lord so the Spirit can speak. It's like me going home, watch this, and disconnecting my cable TV and putting the rabbit ears back on my TV. Some of you young folks, you don't even know what rabbit ears are. Every believer has a receiver. And that receiver is the Holy Spirit that's on the inside of you. Let me give you, let me give you one last scripture that I think is powerful about worship. One more tool that worship does, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done in five minutes. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, it's a, it's a powerful picture of, of a bad day in Isaiah's life. And he says, in the, in, the year, in the year that King Uzziah died, I love this, he says, I saw the Lord. Now here's the good news. On one of the worst days of his life, he saw the Lord. How many know when a bad day shows up, you need to see God? In the year that he, everything that he had put his future, he banked his future on this guy. This was the king. This was the guy who controlled the future. This was the guy who controlled. Have you ever, have you ever put your confidence in something and it died? You ever put your hopes, your dreams, your future in a relationship and it died? In a job and it died? And a friend and they walked out. In the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord. The Bible says as he looked up, he was high, he was lifted up, he was on his throne. He said his train filled the whole temple. And the angels were flying around that throng singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. In other words, Isaiah, it's been a bad day, but God is still God. And then he says when the angels, watch this, this is beautiful. When the angels had finished that worship experience, it says they dipped down to the altar. And from the altar, it says they pulled out a piece of coal hot coal and they placed it on the lips of Isaiah you ever, you ever tasted hot coffee on your tender lips did it hurt it burned didn't it you know what I believe this is telling us that was the altar of worship where the incense was worship watch this worship sometimes hurts Worship doesn't always feel, worship isn't always this feel good experience. Worship, listen, worship is intended to purify us, to burn the impurities out of us. Whenever we're really worshiping, sometimes God exposes the things that's in us that, not, that aren't intended to be in us. Worship reveal, listen, worship is a revealer, true worship will reveal what's truly inside of us. You ever notice hot water has a, has a way of bringing out whatever's in us? We all like tea bags, you know that, right? You don't really know what you're made of until somebody drops you in hot water. And then whatever's in you is coming out of you. That's what Isaiah was saying. Then he goes on and he says, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. They touched him with the coal and right after that, God says, 
I need someone to go for me. I need someone to speak for me. Who am I going to send? Who's going to go? Who's going to speak on my behalf? And Isaiah, he says, he says, send me, I'll go. And somebody says, well, wait, you just said that your lips weren't even clean. And he says, oh, they weren't clean. Until in the middle of worship, my worship began to purify my heart. And my worship began to purify my lips. And those lips that that at one time I had made a mess of things. Now God was using those very same lips to communicate his message. My failures, God was about to use them as a success. Isaiah was finding out when he's out making a bunch of mistakes, you know what God was doing? He was out back making a lot of mercy. When you and I come into worship, it takes the mistakes and the messes of our life and it replaces those mistakes and those failures and those regrets with the mercy of God. And God begins to use our weak places to make us strong. Our mistakes he begins to use as his message. But it's only when we come to a place of ministry to the Lord. My hope for you, that, my hope for you is that as you, Casey, I'm ready, whenever you are. My hope for you is that you will forever, 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 forever remember that an event fan or an event Christian is one that bounces from one Sunday to the next, from one event to the next. They want to hear what songs they're going to sing, what the preacher's going to preach, what have you done for me lately, but you live malnourished through the rest of the week. But when you learn, when I learn, in the presence of God, whether it be in your car driving down the road, Last night I was standing on my balcony after WrestleMania ended and I just stood out there and I looked over to my right and the fireworks came up out of that Raymond James Stadium. And right there, I just finished praying. I'd been downstairs on the treadmill and I'd come up from praying. I walked out on the balcony and I looked out to the right and I saw the fireworks. They thought it was for WrestleMania. I said, God, that was for me. Thank you, God. Thank you for reminding me that your light's in me, that your fire is in me, that when I preach your word, it'll be like fireworks in people's hearts. It'll be like fireworks in people's lives. God, thank you for that. You know what that was? That was ministry unto the Lord. My response for who he is. Thank you again for joining us for today's broadcast. Our prayer is that it ministered to you and it changed your life. If there's anything we can pray with you about or God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, please send us an email to info at citylifechurch.cc. We want to invite you to be our guest at one of our Sunday or Wednesday worship experiences. And you can find our times and locations on our website at citylifechurch.cc. You can also download our City Life Church app on your smartphones or tablets for more online messages. It was great having you with us today, and we'll see you next time.